Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Mr. Brad Palumbo, um, fee.org correspondent, National Review contributor, very smart guy, very accomplished, has been cited by top lawmakers such as um, Senator Rand Paul and Senator Ted Cruz, if you consider them to be top lawmakers. All right, how are you, Brad? Good to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. Absolutely, man. We're gonna talk about inflation, maybe get into uh, taxation of billionaires, etc. Um, let's start with just taxation and, and inflation and, and what's happening right now in the current matrix because people are feeling the pinch, man. Uh, people are really feeling this inflation and uh, there seems, seems to be no end in sight. So if you would give us your sentiment and then I will opine. Yeah, look, I think inflation is a serious problem. I think it's crushing American families. I saw something from Bloomberg, it'll cost the average household $5,200 more next year just to maintain their same standard of living. Yeah. However, I don't want people to look at inflation and think that this is just something that miraculously happens. It has many factors, but two of the big ones are the Federal Reserve's decision to print trillions of new dollars over the last few years and the Biden administration and the Trump administration before for them decision to run up multi trillion dollar deficits at a time when supply was constrained leading to price hikes. So don't just think of inflation as something that's happening. We have to hold our leaders accountable too. Yeah, I agree with you. I'll just add one more leg to that chair. And that would be the disruption in the manufacturing of goods, which also is a catalyst for inflation in the United States and really beyond. So what we have here, and I'm glad you contextualized it the way you did. Because what happens in the political conversation, we have a tendency to be tribal. Tribalism means all you're trying to do is figure out how to blame the other person for things that are bad and take credit for yourself for things that are good. The truth is, not only was Trump a catalyst for inflation, Biden is a catalyst for inflation. And really the last seven presidents combined did not fundamentally transform the system so we would not have this vulnerability in the system that would invite inflation at this level. So at this point, because the guy who's in charge is Biden. And I think there are some things Biden could do quickly and should do quickly. Um, but I would like to know your thought on what do you believe Biden should do now in order to decrease this extra $5,000 a year needed to maintain the same living standard for the average American family. Well, I think two things. One is that unfortunately this cat is to some degree out of the bag. What yep. we're dealing with now is inflation that stems from policy decisions made a year ago or two years ago. So it's not, there's nothing you can do to instantly change it, right? Because we're still feeling inflation that's in part due to money printing and government spending that occurred under Trump and from the American Rescue Plan that was way back in May of 2021. So it's delayed by many months as this stuff works through the system. So there's no easy fixes for Biden. What I will say though is he needs to stop blaming scapegoats. It's not all his fault, but he's trying to do things like say it's Putin's price hike or deflect blame onto Vladimir Putin. And to be clear, before you cut me off, right? Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine is wrong and it's definitely led to higher gas prices over the last few months with tremendous disruption in global energy markets. But they're trying to blame most of this on Putin when this started nine months before the invasion. And core CPI, core inflation, even without gas prices is still 6.5%. So if they want to fix it, they've got to stop making excuses. Well, let me say this, brother. The reason why you do have to calculate that into the matrix is because the majority of Americans actually do either drive or they utilize some form of transportation where the price of gasoline is calculated into how they get to work and how they're able to live, work and play. So that's a reason why that's part of the hype. I know that, but gas prices were rising for a year before the invasion started. Well. Definitely understand that, but are you trying to make the argument that this international conflict has not contributed to oh, no, the higher gas prices? Okay, I'm that's my only saying point, they brother. can't deflect all the blame onto that because well, it's, it's already it's, happened. It's not a deflection of blame when you have two uh, fairly researched individuals who are providing an analysis based on actual facts. When the Jen Psaki says 70% of the inflation in March was because of Putin's price hike, even though inflation was still 6.5% with gas prices factored out, right. that is a deflection and it is not true. Well, that's a lie. That was a lie. 
Um, so yeah, I agree with you on that. It wasn't 70% attributed to one factor. That's never how it goes. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is inflation, when you do the economic study of inflation, we like to nationalize the data. The truth is inflation is a variable dynamic that's different in different regions in the United States of America impacted by how the local economy depends on particular goods, etc. And how they have either fortified their transportability or they have a vulnerable transportability and that will cause higher inflation regionally. Let me take it to Texas. Texas depends a lot on shipments that come in from Mexico. It's one of their main trading hubs. Where the Texas governor, I'm sure you are well aware, created a policy. This is a Republican governor who created a policy that said, we're going to crack down on illegal immigration, okay? And what was his methodology? His methodology was, we're now going to check all of these legal transports coming into the state. Even though legally they could not go inside of them, they could not just do a search of them. It was basically eye candy, it was red meat to his base. But what did it do? It slowed down the entry of goods so much that according to his own numbers from the state of Texas, he decreased the Texas economy by $100 million a day. That's on his own website. He then overturned his policy citing that now he has a better relationship with the authorities in Mexico and he's willing to forego that program and he then turned his own executive policy over. But the reason why he turned his executive policy over or turn or decided to vote against his own executive action is because people started to expose that this action was to do one thing. It was to increase inflation in Texas so that during midterms and the presidential election cycle, he could blame record inflation on Democrats. He could blame it on Democrats when Republicans, I'm not talking about Republican leaders. I'm talking about Republican truckers. When they started to go on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and call out the governor for doing this, all of a sudden the governor changed his message and overturned his own executive order. My point to you was this, that contributed contributed $100 million as a decrease. That took away $100 million of economy from Texas and, and by extension surrounding states. Why do you think? The administration, and I think Democrats are horrible at messaging. I do believe Republicans play games like this as well. But why do you think the messaging has not been centered around the reality of regional inflation and only the nationalized conversation? Well, because to some extent it is happening everywhere um, and it is happening across a wide array of goods, some places worse than others. And I agree, look, it sounds like I don't know a ton about the specifics, but it sounds like what Governor Abbott did was a silly political stunt that made things worse. Uh, And so I'm not here to defend that, but I will say that's that's a small piece of this puzzle that has many different factors. And I don't think people are going to be convinced by just, even Jen Psaki has brought this up about the Texas governor. And if they, even if there's merit to some of what they're saying, it's like they don't have a solution. And you can't just say, well, because the Texas governor did something stupid. That doesn't give you answers for the voters across the 50 states who are feeling this at the grocery store, who are feeling this at the gas pump, and they know To some extent, while there are many factors, a lot of this comes back to the government's role in the economy. You can't shut down an economy, run a money printer, and run up multi-trillion dollar deficits without causing some degree of inflation. But I ask you the question again, and I agree, inflation is an ebb and flow of economic variables. But I ask you the question again, right now Biden is in charge. Everything doesn't have to be your fault for you to be responsible for everything, he's the president. He's responsible for it no matter how it came to his desk. So what action would you recommend the president do right now in order to lessen the grip of this inflation that's happening to American families? Well, he should push the Federal Reserve to chill with the quantitative easing, but that's not directly in his control. And then he should balance the budget immediately because running up 
Deficits are inflationary, running up a $3 trillion deficit and voting for the American Rescue Plan, which added a $1.9 trillion to the deficit. Mm -hmm. There already was deficit spending under Trump and they were doing it. It, it was more than deficit spending, sir. And he Democrats set the made it much he, worse. Hold on, wait a minute, brother, wait a minute. Let's, let's be very fair about the analysis here. Uh, Donald Trump broke modern day records. For deficits, but that was at the height of the COVID nineteen emergency. Okay, the worst possible the, time. The, the guy, it. the guy already had the trajectory. He he mastered the model. He even said that the the first tax cut that was a big hey, this is going to be the biggest tax cut for middle class families in the history of America. Wasn't even close, brother. Wasn't even close to that. So you, I, I just wonder, was Trump so delusional? That he believed these policies would work, or was he just so ignorant that he believed whatever the last person told him would work? That may be another conversation. I, so I think that Trump uh, didn't really care about the deficit because he knew it would be the next president's problem. Mm. And that's been the approach of many presidents now. Uh, just kind of, and now Joe Biden's, he's got stuck with the hot potato, right? Yeah. Because this has been building and building. And so it's not completely his fault for that reason, but he's done nothing but make it worse since he took office. So I would recommend he pivot on that immediately. Let me ask you about a couple of items because one obviously is um, supply chain, all right? When you have a disruption in supply chain and we have a globalized economy now, you can't get away from that. That disruption um, is a catalyst for inflation. Also another catalyst that's more of a domestic item, uh, is the near record job openings without people going to work, okay? So you have near record job openings in America. You have individuals who are not filling those jobs. And when you look at the analysis of why, people assumed initially, uh, and I know you remember this, people said, oh, it's because they're getting free money. They're getting COVID and stimulus checks. Well, nobody can really, yeah, I mean, you can't ball on the stimulus check. I mean, they, they were sending these things out you know, months at a time, but it wasn't- Okay, but you could money. live off the unemployment benefits that aren't in place okay, anymore. But, but even when it- but but look at the data, brother. Even when it stopped, because if that logic were true, what you just said, that means that when the unemployment checks stopped, when the subsidies were suspended, money that we gave the government to take care of us in case of an emergency, when that money or that subsidy was suspended, you would have seen an influx in the job market. That's what everybody said. That's what the economists said. That's what conservatives said. And that's even what Democrats said. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. Now we have the data. We don't have to guess about the data. The reason why you still have this extreme disconnect between a lot of jobs being available and individuals are available to work but choosing not to. You know the number one reason according to the data? Do you know? Child care? Actually, child care is number three. Number one is wages, which can be connected to child care, obviously. You make more money, you can take care of expenses. The number one reason is because these jobs don't pay enough money. Now there has been a natural response in the market where jobs are paying more money now. You have some jobs paying $18, $19 an hour. You got some saying we pay $15 an hour, but still that's not enough. That's not moving people off the sideline. My point to you is when we see this, this, this economic reality that says a big reason why people are not returning back to work, which by the way is a catalyst for inflation as well, is because Jobs don't pay enough money, something that progressives have been saying for decades in this country. Once again, you all were wrong about the why. You all said the why was because of subsidies. When the subsidies stop, it was still there. It didn't change the reality of these jobs being available and American workers not connecting to them. Tell us why you all were so wrong on that premise or that conclusion. Well, I just don't think we were wrong. I think there's a reason that you saw red states return to their pre-pandemic unemployment rates way faster than blue states across the board. One of those reasons is cutting off the subsidies earlier, but we'll have to go through a whole nother- Sir, I don't know, I need you to cite the date on that because the red states I'm aware of, which include Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama, they have not recovered their economy to the tune of the jobs available and people that are actually ready to be employed. They have yeah, not look, I'll done send that. you the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Out of the 10 states that have returned to the pre-pandemic employment, eight or nine of them are red states. Okay, out of the 10 states. So how many Republican states do you have in this country? 24, 26, I actually don't know off the top of my head. Okay. All right, send me that data, I would love to analyze it. But the bottom line is states regardless of political affiliation, they're not on average, they are absolutely not 
uh, employing people at the level of the job market that's available. There's a reason for that because you all were wrong about subsidy. All right, we got more. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for being on the show Thanks. as always. Okay.